forget. Cool. Uh, I think now everything is fine. Uh, so uh, you have the final pro proposed project uh, topics uh, for uh, natural language processing and statistical learning. Uh, and uh, of course, you can also propose uh, your, your own topics. Uh, and uh, you have uh, as deadline uh, next week uh, to uh, choose a topic and uh, to, to propose your team. Uh, and also next week, uh, you need to present a short presentation to five minutes, uh, which is a topic you have chosen, which is a team and what you know uh, up to the, the, the moment about uh, the topic. Maybe why you chose a topic, do you know anything about it? Uh, is like uh, a way to, to make you uh, read at least a little bit uh, 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 something related to, to your project topic and to start working. Um, okay, so uh, this is related to the projects and uh, uh, um, like to, to your assignments. Uh, if you have any questions, like is everything okay until now? Questions, problems? If not, uh, then we can uh, start uh, today's lecture and uh, we're going to talk about uh, linear uh, regression models. Uh, so we have already seen uh, in the introduction to machine learning, let's say to statistical learning, uh, what a linear regression model is. Uh, now we're going to extend it. Uh, so in the, example, in the example that we have used on polynomial curve fitting, uh, we have uh, defined uh, a simple linear regressor, uh, regressor uh, which was a function y of x and w, which was actually a linear combination of polynomial uh, functions. Yeah, like you can see here, we have the polynomial functions. Here we have x power 0, x power 1, and so on, up to x power m. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is a linear polynomial uh, model. Uh, and we have seen that we can write it uh, in, in a simpler format, like being a sum from 0 to m out of uh, weight j multiplied with uh, x, power, uh, x power j. Uh, and uh, actually, we said uh, w is an array of weights, and uh, this is why we have it in bold. So actually W, we can write it like this, is W0, W1, up to the last one, WM. Uh, and uh, the, our objective was uh, given a set of training uh, points uh, or, or a training set, like the blue uh, points uh, in, in the figure, uh, to determine the best fit, uh, the, uh, the best linear polynomial fit uh, for, for the objective function. The objective function in our case was a green uh, sinusoidal function. Uh, in a, now we're going to extend the discussion. So it's not only linear regressor models. We're going to talk about linear models for regression. In general, if we have a linear model for regression, if we can write uh, the regressor function, so here we have the regressor function, uh, being as a linear combination of basis functions. So in our case, the basis functions were polynomial. But we could have uh, more generic basis functions. So we have uh, m basis functions in this situation from 0 to m minus 1. And we have a linear combination uh, of uh, basis functions. So phi, uh, j uh, are called uh, the basis functions. And uh, you see, uh, in general, x is not a scalar because x uh, uh, it's actually uh, an array because we, we have like the features for uh, our training data. So uh, X in general is not a scalar as we have over here where we have like a, a simple uh, uh, one dimensional uh, input. In general, we can have a K dimensional input. So this is K dimensional. Uh, and uh, this uh, basis function will act on this k-dimension uh, uh, feature space or variable. Uh, in the simplest way, like if we use like a linear linear basis functions, we could say that uh, 
will have a combination of all the uh, individual features and we're going to have uh, something like phi d uh, of x would be like the value the scalar value uh, xd in this array so if x is an array uh, we'll have uh, the this feature uh, but this is like uh, in, the, in the simplest case when you hear about linear basis for regression in the more general case we could have any kind of uh, basis function and actually what we have done here we say not only is that we can write everything in a simpler format like this, we can also write it even more, uh, even simpler using algebraic uh, notation or matric mat matricial notation. So uh, if uh, W is a column vector, we can write it as being W transposed multiplied with phi, where phi is uh, uh, a vector uh, of basis functions. So if uh, W is a column vector, W transpose is going to be a line, a row vector. So it's going to be something like this, multiplied with a row vector of basis functions. Phi zero of X, Phi one of X, Phi one of X, and so on and so forth, up to Phi M minus one of X. Uh, so we can write it even simpler using this matricial or algebraic notation. Uh, and actually, this is the definition for a linear regression model. This is everything we have. And what we need to compute, we need to compute the best parameters, the best weights uh, in order to fit our data. Uh, actually, this way of writing uh, a, a, a model uh, uh, in uh, algebraic uh, notation or in matricial notation, uh, you can do it the same for uh, uh, neural networks, for example, because neural networks are still a multiplication, uh, but it's a multiplication here. Instead of having an array uh, vector, you're going to have a matrix. Uh, and you're going to get this output, not a point, uh, but uh, uh, an output array. Uh, so for other models, like for neural networks and for other models, we can. it's still important to understand this uh, way you, you to write in algebraic notation. And now related to the basis functions, of course, the simplest uh, basis functions are polynomial, as uh, we have seen. So uh, if X is a scalar, so we'll have only one feature, we can have something like X power J. And so each, each basis function phi J is going to be X power J. Uh, and of course, we're going to have like uh, x power 1, uh, x power 2, like you can see x power 1, uh, the green one, x power 2, uh, sorry, x power 2 is somewhere over here, uh, the blue one, then x power 3, and so on. Uh, polynomial basis function might have a disadvantage, the fact that they act globally. So uh, a polynomial basis function acts globally. So we cannot say that uh, it, uh, we cannot make a polynomial uh, basis function only act on a specific part of the x domain. So if this is a domain, this is x, we cannot make restrict a polynomial basis function to act only on one part of the domain. All of them act on the entire domain, so they are global. If you want to have like local uh, basis functions, and uh, this makes sense in, in, in machine learning, then there are uh, several types. Uh, two of the most uh, used ones are Gaussian basis functions. So this is not a Gaussian distribution. It's just a function. It's similar to the Gaussian distribution, but it, it, like we have EPOW, uh, something which is similar to the Gaussian, but it's not a distribution. It's not uh, because it's missing the, regulariza uh, the regularization coefficient in front. Yeah. So this is the main difference. Uh, so it's not a correct distribution, but it uh, has the same uh, form, if you want. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, here, like they are local. For example, here the uh, red Gaussian basis function uh, has the mean here in zero, and it also has like a standard deviation. S is a standard deviation, uh, and you can control like the precision. So again, you have a precision like uh, for a standard deviation. Uh, how local you want this function to be. Uh, and now uh, each basis function uh, only affects locally. So for example, this red basis function only affects uh, uh, X in this space. Uh, and uh, besides this space, it won't affect. And uh, you can define how precise uh, or how local a Gaussian basis function is by setting up uh, uh, the precision of the standard deviation. 
In a similar way, you have sigmoid basis functions, and this is like the shape of a sigmoid basis function. Again, the red one is local. It only affects this part of the input, uh, and uh, it uses a sigmoid function. The sigmoid function is one divided by one uh, plus exponential of minus a. Uh, it's a function which is used a lot in uh, machine learning. Uh, also in neural networks, you have sigmoid activations. Uh, and again, you have like a mean, like where is the inflection point? This is a mean, for example, uh, and uh, how, uh, uh, like also like a deviation if you want, how precise you want or how local you want, uh, it's called the slope S, this function to be. Um, cool, so from now on, we're gonna use like generic basis functions. So we're gonna call them phi J, uh, and now, the first thing to do is like we use the information that we got in the introduction and we want to compute. So our aim is uh, how to compute. The best fit. W. So how to compute the best fit uh, or the best set of weights? Uh, and uh, we, you have seen that we have several alternatives. The simplest one is to use maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood treatment, yeah? And uh, we have seen that in the maximum likelihood treatment, we say that uh, in machine learning, uh, each uh, target or each random variable is affected by a noise. And in the simplest case, our noise is a Gaussian function. And now we're gonna, we're gonna say, like the target is the value of the regressor. So right now we're gonna decompose the target into the actual value of the regressor function plus a noise. Uh, so right now epsilon is a noise and this noise is Gaussian. So actually the noise is Gaussian, it's a Gaussian, it's a normal distribution. So it's P of uh, epsilon divided by beta. So we have how precise is this noise? Like do you allow a large noise or a, 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 a narrow noise, a small noise? And it's a normal distribution is centered on zero because we don't have any bias. So uh, you, you, like here the average will act as a bias, like it, it will shift uh, uh, the noise up or down or the targets up or down. And we don't have any intuition to shift them up or down. Uh, we only al allow some specific noise. And we have seen this in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we represented this in, in the following way. So here it's OX. And we have said uh, that on the oh, y axis, uh, on the target, if you want, y of or target, here instead of having a pointwise prediction, so instead of having y of x and w, we're gonna have right now, we're gonna have a distribution. So it's a distribution which look like this. Uh, and this is, this is actually the distribution of the target. So it's the distribution of the target affected by the Gaussian noise. And the way to understand it, it's actually an overlap of two signals. The first signal, it's actually is, uh, the value uh, of the regressor function. Uh, and the second one is this Gaussian noise. And what we have here depicted is a Gaussian noise. So of course here it would be the Gaussian noise and the Gaussian noise is shifted by the, uh, by the value of the uh, regressor function because Otherwise, the Gaussian noise would, would so the, the, the Gaussian noise would always be uh, over here at zero, but it's shifted by the value of the regressor function. Yeah. So you have two functions which are additive: the noise and the value of the predictor. Uh, okay, but uh, when we sum up uh, the two functions, we're going to get the fact that the target right now for a specific point x, it, it, it's. Uh, now from the Gaussian distribution. So now when you add a constant value with a Gaussian distribution centered on zero, you're gonna get the fact that we have a value from a, a normal distribution. And the normal distribution is centered on the value of the, uh, uh, of the predictor. Uh, and now you'll have like uh, beta, the precision, beta minus one, it's uh, the standard deviation now. Uh, and now uh, what we said in maximum likelihood, and this is what we usually have. So it's a regression task. In a regression task we have, uh, an, an array of points, of uh, uh, points in the training set, x1 up to xn, this is a training set, and we ha have their, their corresponding targets. So actually here we say we have a training set of n points, and we want to compute the likelihood function. 
So uh, the likelihood function, now we use the fact that all these points are, points are IID. So we use uh, IID treatment, which means they are independent, but they are from uh, the same distribution, so they are identically distributed. Therefore, if they are independent, here is a probability of the target, so it's a joint probability. We can write it like this if you want, with probability of T1 joined with T2 up to the last one, Tn, given x, the weights, and the precision. So it's a joint probability, and we write it that it's actually a product of the individual probabilities. So it's a prob P of Ti given everything else, with i uh, going from 1 to n. So it's P of Ti, here we say it's P of, uh, instead of i, we use n in the slides. Uh, so with n going to 1 up to upper n, uh, out of the probability of each individual target, each individual target it's from this Gaussian distribution. And actually what we want to compute right now are the parameters of the model. So the parameters of the model in our case is a set of weights and uh, the precision of the noise or how much noise we have in the training data. Uh, and uh, this is called maximum likelihood. So we have the likelihood function. We'd like to compute the, uh, uh, its maximum. You know, in order to compute this maximum, we have seen that actually we use maximum log likelihood. This is the actual treatment, so we compute the logarithm out of the joint probability. When we compute the logarithm of a product, we we'll get a sum of logarithms. More than the fact that we get a sum of logarithms, we we'll get the fact that right now the logarithm will act on uh, e pow something minus x minus mu power 2, so on and so forth. So we'll, uh, so we'll act on, uh, on an exponential. So logarithm of an exponential is perfect because the exponent goes, uh, uh, drops down and uh, actually the uh, uh, e power something fades away. Uh, so in the end, when we uh, compute uh, uh, the log likelihood function, we're going to get to the fact that the log likelihood function, it's actually this. The log likelihood function, it's n divided by 2 logarithm of beta minus n divided by 2 logarithm of uh, 2p. Uh, this is from the normal, normalization coefficient uh, in front of uh, e power something. And then we're going to get the fact that it's min minus beta multiplied with the error in the data. So ed is the error in the data. And we, we define the fact that it's actually the sum of squares error. Okay. The sum of square zero, which is uh, actually uh, uh, the target minus the value computed by our, by our regress, uh, regressor function. So if you look over here, actually here you have that this is y of w and xn. So uh, this is why it's called a squared error, because you have the difference between the correct value, the target, and uh, the values that we have just predicted with our regressor function which is y uh, of w and xn. Uh, cool, and uh, we want to uh, uh, maximize, uh, so we want to maximize the likelihood to compute the most probable uh, joint distribution. You see that over here we have a minus in front of the error, which means that if we want to maximize the likelihood, actually what we do, we actually want to minimize the sum of squares error. So the two are the same. So maximizing the likelihood is the same of minimizing the error uh, in the data. Uh, and now in order to compute, uh, uh, first we need to compute, we have two parameters. So we first we compute the weights and then we compute uh, uh, beta, uh, the, the precision of the noise. What we need to do, we need to go back to mathematics 101 and we need to compute the gradient with respect to each uh, uh, variable. Uh, so first the gradient or the derivative with respect to w, and then the gradient with respect to beta. And first we, we compute uh, the derivative with respect to w of the log likelihood. Uh, and actually here you see is a quadratic function. So actually if it's a quadratic function, what happens? The two will go in front. So these two will go in front, it will fade away with the two that we have over there. And actually we're gonna have something like this. So it's gonna be the same function, Tn 
minus the weights multiplied with a, uh, uh, with a basis function, with a ray of basis function. Uh, and then we need to compute the derivative of this once more. So we need to compute against the derivative and the derivative to this one more. It's actually uh, phi uh, of, X, uh, of uh, X of N transpose. So uh, because we actually need to compute the derivative of this function with respect with respect to W, and uh, it's, we, we, we only get this, uh, uh, this array of uh, basis functions. So this is what we get, and now when uh, when we uh, equalize this with zero, we get the fact that W maximum likelihood it's actually uh, computed by computing first uh, uh, the reverse of a matrix. Uh, so we need to compute uh, this is a, a matrix, so it's not an array; it's bolded and uh, uppercase. So it's phi transpose multiplied with phi minus one multiplied with field transpose multiplied with the array of targets. So again, we write it in a matricial or algebraic notation. Uh, and now phi, this is called the design matrix. And then actually the design matrix is uh, very important for um, uh, linear models of regression. It's actually a matrix that has a size n, n rows and m columns. Uh, and you, you have the value of all uh, the basis functions. So for each column, you have each basis function, the, the zero, like the first one, the second one, and so on, in all the points in the training set. So all the basis functions computed in all the points in the training set. Uh, and actually, this is everything you need to do. So if you want to, if you have ever used a linear model for regression, so if you want to predict like the prices for uh, real estate, uh, 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 everything you need, uh, you need to do is to compute uh, uh, this uh, 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 matrix, the design matrix, and then to, to uh, make uh, use of uh, the reverse and uh, some matrix multiplications. Um, Cool. Uh, which is a complexity? Anyone? Nobody there, which is a complexity. Like uh, if we look at the complexity from an algorithmic point of view, yeah, because we need an algorithm. Actually, in order to compute uh, the weights, we need an algorithm. W where does this complexity come from? Because, like we are computer scientists. Okay, we have some mathematics. Like uh, in machine learning, we have a good mix of computer science and mathematics. Uh, and uh, yeah, everything that uh, uh, goes in this mix. Uh, but uh, uh, in the end, we need to have an algorithm computing uh, the linear regression uh, weights, uh, which is a complexity of this model. And uh, where does this, does this complexity come from? So actually the complexity is, uh, it comes from performing these operations. So first and foremost, we need to multiply these matrices and to compute the reverse of a matrix. Uh, do you know, or do you remember which is a complexity for computing the reverse of a matrix and which is a complexity for multiplying matrices? Well, I guess for multiplying matrices is uh, M or N. M multiplied with N. Um, for multiplying matrices, it's actually uh, uh, quad it's quadratic. It's like uh, 
number of lines for the first matrix multiplied with number of columns for the first matrix, which is uh, the same as number of lines for the second matrix, multiplies with number of columns for the second matrix. Uh, so it's actually quadratic. Uh, and uh, here it's, it's kind of the same. So the complexity over here would be, first we need to compute the reverse of a matrix, which is M multiplied with M. So it's phi transpose phi, which is M multiplied with M. So, and computing the reverse of a matrix, it's again quadratic. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, 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 M power three, uh, and then uh, we have this matrix. So this matrix is M multiplied with M. Uh, is this one? We need to multiply it with a matrix which is M multiplied with uh, N, and here we get M power two multiplied with N, uh, and actually this would be uh, the complexity. So it's theta of m power 3 plus m power 2 multiplied with n. So it's a pretty big complexity. Uh, therefore, you cannot compute, uh, if you have a, a, a large number of weights, so if you want to have a large number of, uh, of basis functions, uh, you, you cannot uh, actually compute uh, the regressor uh, easily. You can just approximate it. Yeah. So if you want to have like m equal to 1,000, 1,000 power 3 uh, is going to be too much uh, on a normal computer. So it's important to understand uh, yeah, where is a bottleneck from a computational point of view. Uh, cool. Uh, so the bottleneck is the fact that we need to multiply matrices to compute uh, the reverse of a matrix and so on. Uh, and uh, like uh, if, if we want to look at the bias, so the bias of a model us usually it's uh, like it's uh, as a parameter W0, and the parameter W0 is multiplied with uh, the uh, function uh, 1, like f of x is always equal to 1, uh, or phi of x is equal to 1. Uh, if we look at which is the value for W0, the value for W0 is actually the difference uh, between the average for the target, so the average over all the points in the training set of the targets, minus the value which is predicted by uh, uh, the average value which is predicted by our uh, model uh, for all the other basis functions besides uh, phi zero. So this is for phi zero, and this is a value that we get minus phi zero. So it would be like the value y uh, computed without phi zero, uh, without having any bias. So the bias, it's actually the difference between the correct value and the predictions as a scalar, if you want. Uh, and there is one thing we haven't computed, so we have computed, uh, this is called W maxim maximum likelihood, so the weights computed using a maximum likelihood treatment. We still need to compute the precision, so how precise uh, uh, or how much noise we should have, so how, how few noise or how much noise we should have. Here it's actually the standard deviation, if you want, is the variance. So it's one over precision, it's called variance. So uh, the variance is actually given by the variance we have uh, in, in our data. So it's given by, this is like the variance between the targets and uh, the value of the predictor. Yeah. So if the predictor is very uh, has a very good fit, so if this error is very small, it goes to zero, then beta uh, uh, will go to infinity. Like beta going to infinity, it means it will be very precise. Like you won't have any noise. If this value is very large, like the error between the targets and the uh, predictor, then uh, uh, the precision will be very small. Like we won't trust uh, the value computed by our regress regression regressor function. We will have lots of noise if you want. Uh, a, a way to think about lin a linear regression model, like it from a geometrical point of view, you have a discussion you can uh, read more carefully in Bishop. Uh, from my point of view, I think that this discussion is better explained in Murphy. So uh, you have about uh, one or two pages in Murphy, which are better explained. So actually what we, we say, we say that uh, we, we have a uh, Z array Y, 
which is a, the array uh, of the predictions made uh, by all, all the points in our uh, training set. Yeah. Uh, and so actually why here it's an array and it's actually uh, y1, y2, up to yn transpose. Uh, so actually the predicted value y1 it's y of x1 and w. So this is how you should interpret it. Uh, so this array y it's actually uh, a linear combination uh, it's a linear combination uh, of, uh, 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 of vectors which are spent in a, a m dimensional space. So this m dimensional space is a space, this is still phi, so this is uh, phi in Greek, uh, it's a lowercase phi. So phi one up to phi one uh, are like, uh, are the basis of this m dimensional space, which is S. So S it's an m dimensional space, which is, if you want, it's a subspace uh, in, in the n dimensional uh, space of the targets. So we live in an n-dimensional space because we have n targets, but we want to predict the value of the targets using only m values. And usually the values m, they are smaller, many times they are much smaller than the values uh, of, of, of the number of targets in the training set. So actually we, we, we in, in a subset or in a hyper uh, plane, we want to compute uh, the best approximation of the targets. So we are in an n-dimensional space with uh, the vector of targets, and actually we would like to find the best fit in this uh, m-dimensional uh, plane. And actually the best fit, which is the best fit? What does this drawing suggest us? The drawing suggests us that the best fit in this space in S is a projection of the targets. Yeah, so uh, the targets are in a larger space. We cannot compute them perfectly, but the best thing that we can compute is to compute like the uh, orthogonal projection. So here is the orthogonal projection. And actually what happens, we would like to have this error, like this would be the error uh, between the difference between the prediction, the regressor and the target. We would like to have this uh, value as small as possible. So this one uh, is the one that we want to decrease. So out of all the hyperplanes that we can compute, we'll take the one uh, that has the smaller, uh, that computes uh, like uh, the smaller orthogonal, uh, the smallest orthogonal projection. Um, cool, and again, this is a more detailed explanation. If you want, you can uh, go and uh, read the full explanation from Bishop. Uh, and, and now you, you can say, okay, Troyan, but what happens, for example, if we have uh, a larger, like if, if we have a larger, uh, a larger training set, and if we cannot apply, uh, if we cannot apply this uh, mat uh, algebraic uh, formula to compute the weights, can we use a uh, uh, linear model for regression? And we say, yes, we can use linear model for regression. So linear model for regression can, can also be used using gradient descent. So in a similar way to neural networks. So by using gradient descent, we say, we start with some random weights. So if you want W0 would be some random weights, which are very poor predictors. Uh, and then using like stochastic gradient descent, we can compute better and better weights. So uh, at time, uh, 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 tau plus one, the weights are computed by using the weights as, as the previous step, minus uh, uh, eta uh, multiplied with the gradient of the error after seeing the first n points. So here we see we have n points, and here we have n plus one points. So we see one more point. And uh, what happens, uh, so this is called the gradient descent, so we take the, why is called gradient descent? Because we take the values that we had until now and we uh, subtract the gradient of the error with, uh, uh, with a parameter which is called, uh, do you know how, how, which is the name of this parameter, eta?
It's for it's learning, learning rate. rate. Yeah, exactly. It's a le learning rate. So not only neural not, uh, networks use gradient descent, even these uh, like uh, linear models for regression can use uh, gradient descent. So it's a learning rate. So it's minus the learning rate uh, multiplied with the gradient of the current error uh, for n points. Uh, and uh, the current error for n points you have already seen. So it's the quadra it's a sum of squares error. Therefore, when you compute the derivative, it's the same derivative that we have computed uh, actually over over here. So it's actually the same derivative that we have over here. Uh, you can see it's the same one. So when you, you when we see the current point, um, uh, yeah, actually here it's a little it's a small mistake. So here it's n minus one points, and this is n points uh, because what we do, you see, you look at point uh, x n. And target extent. So it's n minus one points, and we look at the current point n. Uh, and uh, if we take the derivative, we're gonna get this uh, value. So it's the difference between the target and the predictor uh, uh, multiplied with the array of uh, uh, basic functions. Uh, cool. So when we can use sequential learning, or it's also called online learning, uh, we can use online learning in two situations. First, when the training data, uh, we don't know, uh, it's actually, uh, we don't know at training. Or we don't know all, all of it of training, like we can get the new data points. Uh, and also we can use it when the training data is too large. If it's too large and we, we cannot use the formulas that we had with matrices, we can use stochastic gradient descent and we'll get a, a pretty good approximation. Uh, yeah, so if it's too large or if we get like uh, continuous training data, we always get new points. Uh, this is called online learning. Uh, we can use sequential, uh, we can use uh, uh, this gradient descent. Uh, we still have a problem like how do we choose eta? It's the same problem that we have for neural networks. Usually eta should vary in time. So uh, uh, actually usually eta should vary in time. Therefore eta should be something like this. It shouldn't be a, a fixed parameter. It should also vary with how many points we, ha we have seen until now, uh, which means that at the beginning eta can vary a lot or it can vary more because you have seen very few points. But as you have seen a large number of points, maybe one million, probably the learning rate should decrease. Yeah, uh, and uh, if you have uh, worked with neural networks for computer vision, you have uh, probably seen this uh, discussion. Uh, cool, and like this ends, like uh, the first part, we have about uh, four or five parts. Uh, the second part is, uh, you have already seen the maximum likelihood leads to biases, and uh, we have seen one way of getting rid uh, of, of these biases uh, that we get. And uh, the first way is like uh, using regularization. And uh, actually the error function should be like error in data plus a regularization term. So the error in the data, the sum of squares that we have seen plus uh, lambda multiplied with the error in the weights. This is uh, the, the regularization part. Uh, and we have seen that uh, in the introduction, there's an error in the weights. It's usually a quadratic uh, re regularizer, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's W transpose multiplied with W. Or if you want, it's norm uh, power two uh, yeah, 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 of, of the weights. Uh, and this is what you want to uh, minimize. So this is the error, uh, the regularized, regularized error. And uh, we want to minimize this error. Um, cool. And I think I made an error. I see said, said that over here uh, the complexity is quadratic. It's not quadratic. It's uh, m power three. It's ter ternary. Yeah, uh, of course. Quadratic is uh, n power two. Uh, and uh, so here uh, we have the, this n, uh, um, uh, uh, w power 2 uh, uh, error. Uh, and uh, this is actually minimized in a similar way. So we can still use uh, algebraic uh, notation. So what, what is different is different that uh, we're going to have here the fact that it's lambda multiplied with i plus 
uh, phi transpose multiplied with phi, and for this uh, matrix we need to compute uh, the inverse. So from from a complexity point of view, from the, an algorithm complexity point of view, using regularization doesn't change any, anything. So it's exactly the same. So using regularization or not using regularization, the time complexity for uh, your linear model for regression, it's exactly the same. Only this matrix is computed a little bit different. Uh, in our case, uh, lambda it's a regularization coefficient, and now it's a hyperparameter of the model. So it's a hyperparameter. We still need to uh, find which is its best value. Uh, and uh, actually, regularizer we we can have more general regularizers or regularization functions. Uh, the quadratic ones that we have seen, uh, it's only one of the functions that it's used. In, in practice, uh, several others can be used. So uh, actually here what we say, it's uh, uh, norm Q. So this notation, it's like norm Q. Uh, and uh, norm Q is defined, you can define it this way. Uh, so the norm of, of uh, Let's say of uh, W uh, or Q, it's something like square root out of Q out of a sum of W i power Q from i going from one to m in our case to the number uh, to the dimension of W. Uh, cool, so it's norm Q, uh, uh, this is a Euclidean norm, so it's a norm, uh, the usual norm that you are used to, so it's squared root uh, out of uh, sum of squares for each component. Lasso, it's uh, something like a Manhattan norm, so it's a L1, so this is called L1 norm, this is L2 norm, and so on. Of course, you can have L.5, L4 norm, and so on, and so forth. So you can have several regularization functions. And actually, what does it mean? Why do we need several regularization functions? Uh, now, for example, when, if you want to lose lasso, has anyone used lasso until now? Like uh, for L1 norm, this is called lasso. It's a specific regularization function. And it's a specific regression function. Like if you go, uh, if you go in scikit-learn, You're going to see here that you have several types of regularization functions and so on and so forth, like scalar, linear regression, and in linear regression, you're going to have like uh, uh, you have like lasso, ridge, and elastic net. And you see here, actually, lasso it's a linear model that has L1 regularization. This is a, a, is the only difference. So lasso means L1 regularization. Like it's important to understand, even if you are only want to be like a, practi a practitioner in machine learning, it's important for you to understand. Like lasso means L1 norm. Why do people use L1 norm and not L2? Why is important? So actually, what happens? So what happens in this situation uh, when we use regularization? Uh, from a geometric point of view, we say. Uh, by using maximum likelihood, W maximum likelihood is computed this way. So this would be W maximum likelihood, this point over here. And actually, when we use regularization, we're going to say that this point over here is not a good fit. Actually, what we want to do, we would like to take the closest uh, value to this point, which is also intersect, uh, intersected with this uh, with this area. Uh, and you, you can interpret it this way. It's the closest value that we have for W to be under norm 2. So for W to be under norm 2, less or equal than uh, a constant, let's say than 1. And this circle is uh, what it means for W to be less or equal than one. So if it's norm two, if it's two dimensional, it's a, it's a circle. If it's L1, 
if it's one dimensional, it's not a circle, it's actually a square like this. Yeah, so this is the lasso that we have uh, seen. And uh, actually we see, so regularization from a geometric point of view takes the closest, so this is W maximum likelihood, but we say this is not good because this is affected by, uh, uh, this is affected by uh, overfitting. Therefore, we take the optimum value that we have uh, as intersection with this uh, area, uh, with this uh, uh, red area. And actually this one is computed by the shortest distance and the shortest distance will be this point W star. When you use lasso, the shortest distance will will most of the times be in one of these points uh, when you have like a, a corner of the uh, uh, of the square. So actually, what does it mean over here? This one means W star. It means that W star zero, so W star one, this value, it's zero. So on the W one axis, W star one is zero. So we only have one coefficient different than, than zero. So only W two star is different than zero. Uh, and this is why we say lasso actually generates sparser solutions. Sparser solutions means it, it, it performs some kind of feature selection. So if you have lots of features and you like to use the ones that are the most relevant, one way of doing it is using lasso. Uh, and also lasso maybe is more explainable because if you have lots, lots of features, you'll only use the ones that are the most relevant. Yeah. So this is why people in machine learning and statistics, especially they kind of prefer sometimes to use uh, lasso uh, instead of uh, L2 norm. L2 norm in practice, if you, were, if you are here, so L2 norm means uh, L2 regression. Yes, so your L2 regression in practice is called ridge re regression. So if you go in scikit-learn or if you hear somebody saying it uses uh, ridge regression, you shouldn't worry that you, we haven't discussed about it. It's actually the normal uh, regression as uh, using L2 norm. So this is called ridge regression. And if you hear somebody saying that they use elastic net, actually elastic net is just a fancy way of saying that uh, we combine L1 and L2 regularization. So elastic net, it's a linear uh, regression model that has both an L1 and an L2 regularization, because nobody says we cannot use all of them, or several of them, not all of them. Uh, cool, and now my question, uh, and uh, my question for 1,000 points, or 100 points, uh, how, how, do, uh, how do we set up uh, the area of this circle? So when we use regularization or the area of this square, so uh, we say, let's say that it's less or equal to one, but usually we could say actually it's less or equal than a constant K. Which is this constant or uh, the constant K depends on what value? On the bias? No. What do we have here that tells us how important regularization is? We have uh, we have seen a discussion uh, in the introduction. Which of the values over here tell us tell us like how uh, how how much we allow regularization to affect our error and to affect our weights actually? The learning rate. Uh, here we don't have learning rate. Probably you want to say the uh, regularization coefficient, no? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so it's actually the regularization coefficient. So actually, how large is this circle or this square is given? So it's a constant, but it's given by uh, something that depends on the regularization coefficient. So if we have a smaller regularization coefficient, then we allow we allow a larger area. Uh, if we have a larger regularization coefficient, like if we are very strict, we, we add a big regularization, this circle is very, very small. Uh, yeah, like remember what happened when we had a very large regularization coefficient, actually the value of the weights were all close to zero. 
the very ones of the weights were all close to zero because this circle was here very close uh, around and about uh, zero. It didn't allow a lot of uh, learning. Yeah. So actually, how big this red circle is? It, uh, and it's not a circle, it's a hypersphere if you want, because we are not in a two-dimensional space, actually we are in an n-dimensional space, so it will be a n-dimensional sphere. Uh, uh, it, it depends on how big or how small the regularization coefficient is. Yeah. Uh, cool, and actually this kind of ends the second part of the class, so regularized uh, least squares solves the problems that we have with overfitting. Uh, as uh, lambda increases, uh, we're, we're going to have, so if lambda increases, then the circle will become smaller and smaller, and an increasing number of parameters are driven to zero, but this will probably go to, uh, into underfitting. And we have some advantages of using regularization. We can uh, uh, have complex model and trained or limited data without worrying of overfitting, but we could still have underfitting, but we, st we still need to compute the value of the regularization coefficient. This is uh, the basic uh, way, idea. Uh, so it kind of limits the model complexity. We don't need to think about which is a number of basis functions. So we don't need to uh, think about which is the best value for M. So best M, we can uh, forget about computing it, but now we need to, we have another problem, which is the best value for lambda, yeah? So it's kind of a trade-off. We don't need to compute the best value for M for the size of the model, but we need to compute the best value for lambda for the regularization coefficient. And now a very short discussion, like if we have multiple outputs, so imagine we have uh, several target vectors. So instead of having a target vector of size one, we have a target vector of size k larger than one. So we have the same input data, but we have several predictors. For example, we could have like the features of an apartment and we can have uh, like, which is a probability uh, for that apartment to, to have a burglary. And we can also have the probability uh, like a, a score, uh, which is a, a, the value of the property. So we can have several targets for, for the same features. Uh, and, and one solution would be, these targets are independent in most situations, or be, if they are dependent, well, probably we don't know exactly how they are dependent. One way is to treat them independently. So to compute k independent regression problems, uh, yeah, uh, and to uh, do it k times. And actually what we see here, we can uh, only do this once, so I'm going to go a little bit faster. So we can, uh, so in a similar way to having only a single input T, we can have several, uh, uh, we could have like K, uh, uh, sorry, instead of having only one target, we can have K targets. And now in a similar way here, uh, we're going to have a set uh, of targets. And now the targets are uh, uh, K, so, and they are independent. And actually what we say over here, actually we can compute you know, only one matricial step. So actually this part is the same that we had until now. The only difference is that at the end, instead of multiplying with an array of targets, we multiplied uh, with a matrix of targets because now uh, instead of having uh, an array of targets like N and one, here we have a matrix of targets N and K because we have K different uh, targets like the price, and uh, which is uh, the criminality rate uh, for that property. Uh, and actually, if we look for a single target, it's the same way of computing independently for that target. But actually, wh wh why, is, why is it more efficient to do it like this? Like, why, does it make, wh why doesn't it make sense to compute individually each set of weights, WK, like this? Because if you only do it once, here the complexity will still still be theta of uh, m power three plus m power two multiplied with n. If you do it k times, the complexity will increase by k. It will be k multiplied with m power three plus k multiplied with m power two multiplied with n. And <laughs> the complexity uh, of having a polynomial of m power three, it's uh, kind of big from the beginning. If you do it k, k times, if you put there k and k is uh, big, uh, it, will, uh, it will increase the complexity. 
And actually, it doesn't make sense because you're going to compute the same matricial operation. So here, you're going to do these operations k times, but they're going to be the same. Like, it doesn't make sense from the compute point of view. Uh, even if you can do it, it will take uh, k times more uh, Amazon uh, elastic compute credits, if you want, or GPU time or CPU time in this case. Uh, and uh, it, it doesn't make sense. You can do it more efficiently. Cool. Like, again, this is more engineering from an engineering point of view. If you have the same features and several targets, you can uh, do it more efficiently. You can just compute uh, these algebraic notations only one, once. Perfect. And now we get to the third part of the class. In the third part of the class, we look at something called uh, the bias variance decomposition. Uh, so, in the bias variance decomposition, like we have a transition going from, uh, like, like this uh, part is uh, 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 fundamenting, if you want, the transition from maximum likelihood to the Bayesian treatment. Uh, it kind of uh, sets a point of why it's important to have Bayesian, uh, Bayesian treatment. So the bias variance decomposition look, looks at uh, what does it mean to have overfitting or underfitting uh, in our models. Uh, and uh, this actually starts on like which is the best model for our data. Uh, and we have two options. If we don't use regularization, we need to compute the best value for M, uh, like for the parameters, the number of parameters of the model, the size of the model. If M is too large, we're going to go to overfitting. If M is too small, we will have underfitting. If we use regularization, the same will uh, apply for uh, the regularization coefficient lambda. Yeah, like uh, if lambda is too large, uh, then we're going to have underfitting. If lambda is too small, then uh, is like not ha having regularization at all. We're going to have uh, 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 overfitting. Uh, and a solution would be to use Bayesian treatment of regression because overfitting is an effect of maximum likelihood. So when we're going to go to the next part, we're going to see that uh, actually Bayesian model for regression uh, doesn't have this problem. But before that, let's take a look from a frequency point of view of model complexity. And this is called bias variance trade-off. And uh, if you remember from uh, last uh, week's course, uh, the discussion with Costin, I think he also handed you uh, a scan with uh, why this formula is correct. So the expected square loss in our data, it's uh, 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 in our data and model, it's uh, always like the uh, uh, errors that we have from the predictor to the correct function. So this is a predictor function y that we compute. X is the real function that we should compute. Uh, and this is the error that we have from the noise. So this is the difference between the correct function and the target. So the co correct function and the target, this is a noise. Yeah? Uh, 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 th this explains why the targets are different from the correct, uh, uh, from the target function. Uh, and the optimal predictor would be the expected value of the targets. Uh, and uh, the second term, actually, we cannot remove it. So if we want to minimize the error, if we want to minimize this error, all we can do is to minimize this uh, uh, this part of the square loss. Uh, and now um, we'll say if we have like an infinity amount of training points and a lot of computational resources to train on an infinite amount of training points or a very large amount, then we could uh, make y as close as possible to h, which would be great. But uh, in real life, we have only a small number of training po points. Therefore, we cannot compute h of x perfectly. So we, we will always have an error between the regressor function and the uh, target function. Uh, and now, this is called frequency, fre frequency is a point of view, because we, we take the following thought experiment. Let's imagine we have several data sets, each of the same size n. This is like it's a frequency is because we assume we have several data points, like we have several, and we can count if you want, we can count, we can compute the expectation on all these data sets. Uh, cool, so on any particular data set, so D would be like the data set, we're gonna compute the best regression functions that we can compute on the data set. So Y of X and D is a uh, regressor function computed on that training set. Uh, and now 
we can look at the errors that we have. So this is the error in one training set. Error in one training set, uh, it's uh, the difference between the regressor, regressor function and the correct target function. That's the one that we need to compute, PAU2. Uh, and here, what we do, we add and subtract the expected value of the regressor function over all the data sets. How, how would you explain the expected value of the regressor function over all the data sets? Like if you put to explain it into simple words, like how would you explain this term that we add and subtract over here? What's an expectation in a simplest way of saying it? Like uh, an expectation is given a distribution, but if the, if the distribution is, uh, let's say, uniform, what's the expectation actually? Like if all these data sets, they have the same probability of being selected, the expectation over all the data sets of the regressor function, it's actually what? The average would be. Yeah, it would be the average. So here what we say is the expectation is all the data sets are, uh, have the same probability. Actually, we're going to say, uh, we're going to take the average uh, of all these uh, functions. Like if you want, to, and you're going to say what's the average function, you could think of having the average on each point x. Like on each point x, if it's discrete x, or even if it's continuous, we can compute the average. So we have like, let's say, the data sets, we have uh, for each value of, the, of x uh, 10 points, and we compute the average. And we can do it even if it's discrete or continuous. Like this for you to have an idea what this term is. And we add and subtract this average. So here we have like the current regress, regressor, regressor function, the best one that we compute for the current data set. And we subtract the average function, the average regressor function, we add it again, yeah, and we, uh, the last term is minus the target function that we need to compute. Uh, and now what we do, we actually put, uh, we're going to say it's a binomial, it's a binomial out of this term and this term. Yeah, and uh, it's a plus b power 2, and it's going to be, it's a power 2, so the first term of the binomial, y minus the expectation power 2, plus the second b power 2, the expectation minus h uh, of x power 2, plus 2 times a multiplied with b. So this is a, and this is b, this is a power 2, this is b power 2, and this is 2 times a multiplied with b. And now what we are doing, we actually would like to see what happens. Uh, so we, oh, this is an error in one data set, but actually what we are interested in, it's a frequency in its point of view. We'd like to see which is the average error in all the, uh, the data sets. Yeah. So this is what we do. It takes the expected uh, loss over all the data sets. So if this is a loss in one data set, we take the expected loss over all the data sets. And when we take the expected loss over all the data sets, something interesting happens. For example, over here, only this part depends on D. So this doesn't depend on D because we also have a, we already have an expectation. This doesn't depend on D because it's already uh, expectation over the, all the domains. This is a function which doesn't depend on the domains and only this function depends on the domains. And actually when we compute expected value of D out of it, we're going to have here the fact that we're going to get the same terms that we have over here. So we're going to have E of D of Y minus E of D of Y. And actually this term will go to zero because it's the same thing. <coughs> so when we take the expected loss over all the domains, uh, we will only get remain with these two terms. So we'll only remain with these two terms. And these terms are called squared bias and variance. The bias is a difference, uh, uh, is the expectation, uh, is a difference between, uh, actually the bias is a difference between the expectation, the expectation of the regressors minus the correct target, and the variance, it's actually uh, the expected value between each regressor and the average of the regressors, regressors if you want. 
Like how much, imagine, why is, why is it called variance? It's called variance because we look how much variance we, we allow between one regressor and the average regressor. Yeah, and this is called bias because uh, it's, it's a bias because it represents how much we allow uh, the average regressor to, to be different from the target, uh, to be different from the target uh, function. So the, the square bias measures how much the average regressor is different from the target. The variance measures how much each individual regressor is different from the average. Yeah, so if you want, this is like average regressor. This is target. Uh, this is like the correct target function, if you want. And here we have individual regressor. Uh, how, how much is different from the average regressor? So actually, the expected loss, now we can write it, it's actually squared bias. Yeah, squared bias plus the variance in the data plus, plus the noise. We can not do anything with the noise. So the noise, we cannot do anything. So if we want to minimize the expected loss, what, what we can minimize, we can minimize the, these two terms, the bias and the variance. But actually what happens, it's difficult to minimize both of them. And this is why we have what, we have what is called uh, a trade-off between bias, uh, between, between uh, variance and bias. Yeah. So in order to minimize the expected loss, we need to uh, minimize both the square bias and the variance, and a constant noise term that we cannot minimize. And we're going to have to take the best trade-off between the two terms. We cannot minimize both of them at the same time. And we have two types of models. Like very flexible models have a low bias and a high variance. Uh, and rigid models have a high uh, bias and a low variance. And we need to take a model which is somewhere in between, not very flexible, not very rigid. Uh, and for example, here we have 25 data points from the sinusoidal function. So the target function, the green one is the sinusoidal. Uh, and uh, each of these data sets has uh, 25 data points and we use 25 Gaussian basis functions. Like imagine, we are prone to overfitting 25 data points and 25 is the size of the model. Without using regularization, we'll have overfitting for sure, if you want. Uh, and uh, actually, here you, you, are, you have the values of each individual regressor, regressor. So here are 25 red functions. And this is the average regressor in red, average regressor or if you want, is the expected value over D out of Y of X and D. What kind of model is this one? What do we have here? High bias or high variance? So the variance is the difference between any of these functions or all of these functions and uh, the average one. Do we have a big difference between these functions and this one? No, they are very similar. So any function from here is very similar to the average one. So we have a low variance, but we have a high bias. Yeah, high bias and low variance. Uh, the average regressor is very far away from the correct uh, value. Uh, here is somewhere in between. So here we is somewhere in between. We have medium bias, if you want, and medium variance. Like if we take each function from here, you, you see any of these functions is not perfectly aligned with the uh, average function that we have over here. There will be some uh, variance. So if you want medium variance and medium here, medium bias. Uh, and if you see over here, you also have the value for uh, the regularization coefficient. Yeah, so regularization coefficient here is very high. Here it's uh, uh, between zero and one, uh, but close to one if you want. And here it's a smaller, here is closer to zero. So here we, we have a small uh, regularization and here we have Low bias, so if you look here at the average uh, predictor, the average predictor looks very, very good. Uh, so very low bias, but 
large variance. If we take any of these individual regressors, they are worse than uh, these ones. Yeah. So the difference between any of this function and the average is, pre is pretty big. Uh, so actually the bias variance trade-off says the uh, error on the test, uh, it's actually, uh, it varies the same way that we have the, uh, the bias, the square of bias plus variance. So you see the uh, black curve and the uh, 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 mauve violet one, I know. Uh, magenta in English. What color is this one in English? Magenta? No? Or something similar? Uh, so they vary in a similar way. So the error on the test uh, is dependent on square bias, uh, pl pl uh, square, square bias plus variance. And actually the square bias plus variance is this decomposed into two parts. The red part is called variance and the blue part is called uh, square bias, yeah? And uh, what we have over here in, in this part, what do we have? What do we call this part in this part? What do we have to the left? Anyone, please? To the left, what do we have? Overfeeding or underfeeding? On the left would be underfeed, and on the right, overfeed. Um, I think it's the other way around. No, this is the other over. way around. No, um. this is overfit. No, uh, because imagine overfit oh, over yes. here, yeah. lambda yes, equal right. to zero means no regularization. No regularization. If we don't have any regularization, we have overfitting. Here we have uh, underfitting. Underfitted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, when we have overfitting, actually, uh, we have uh, uh, a high variance and a low bias. But actually, the variance that we have, the fact that we have here a uh, high variance is not good because uh, uh, we, we, what we have, we have each of these individual functions. Uh, of course, you could tell me, Tryon, if we have all these data sets, why, why don't you compute, compute the average? And uh, this average is very good. Uh, actually, in real life, and uh, this is what we kind of show over here. Like if we have these L data sets, we could, we could compute which is the average, like the expected value of D. So this is, if you want, uh, a simple way to compute the expected value of D over all the data sets. So it's the average over all the L data sets. And we can also express w which is a bias, which is a variance. Uh, so the bias is the difference between this uh, uh, average value and the correct value of the sinusoidal, if you want. And the variance is the difference that we get between each individual predictor and the average predictor on uh, each of these discrete endpoints. And this is a case for a discrete uh, uh, regressor. Uh, and you would say, why don't we average over all the n uh, over all the data sets uh, and we say okay averaging might be very good because we see we can find this average to be uh, uh, great but actually in real life uh, we would like to train on a, uh, on a, as large data set as possible yes yeah, so it, it would be great to average but if it would be great to average if we would have very large data set to do so but in real life uh, we have smaller the small data set and if we uh, split it into 25 uh, smaller data sets we're going to have uh, uh, very poor predictors uh, and it doesn't make sense to, to use this uh, so this is more like a, a sort experiment if we would have uh, a very large data set and it's also a good uh, idea to see what happens uh, so if you have very poor predictors individually if you average them you could have a, a, a better predictor uh, do you know how, how this is called in real life? Like if you average the predictions, you have a better predictor. Like this is useful in practice sometimes, uh, again, from an engineering point of view. 
you have se several models and you use a simple function like the average or uh, something like this to, to take a decision. How, how, how is this called? But boosting. You, yeah, boosting or maybe ensemble. No, it's an ensemble model. So you have several models. Each of them is, uh, behaves uh, poorer uh, than the entire set of models which work together. Like if you want, they are voting or they are uh, using an average uh, predictor. So it kind of makes sense, even this fre fre frequency is point of view, uh, in order to have several models and to make them vote uh, uh, in a, uh, what's called an ensemble model. Uh, and actually, this type of having several models and taking a weighted average of multiple solution lies in the heart of Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian approach. Actually, the Bayesian approach, you can think about, uh, think about having an infinite number of models which uh, make predictions and uh, an average, uh, each of them has a weighted uh, contribution and uh, we take the, uh, 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 we'll take like, we'll have a probability distribution. Uh, instead of having a one point estimate of uh, of the target. Uh, but uh, in the Bayesian approach, the averaging is done with uh, with respect to the posterior distribution of parameters and not with uh, respect to multiple data sets. So to, uh, we're gonna go to Bayesian linear regression. When we say Bayesian linear regression actually is used to escape us from the problem of overfitting, of picking hyperparameters like lambda, uh, and uh, we can uh, have like an automatic way of determining model complexity using only the training data. And actually what we say, we, we said even from here that we'd like to use a posterior distribution of the parameters of the weights. So we would like to make use of the posterior distribution of the weights given the targets by applying Bayes theorem. So first thing to do is to take a prior distribu distribution over the weights. So the weights, Right now, they are sample from a Bayesian distribution, which uh, is uh, 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 M0 mean, A0 covariance. Uh, M0 and A0, like what does this index mean? Because you, you see here it's MN and SN. So actually, what does it mean? It means after seeing zero points, after seeing N, in this case, N equal to zero points. So this is, if you want, a prior. It's an initialization. The, pro the prior, after seeing no points, we uh, we, we we sample them from, from a, it's it's a multi-model uh, uh, it's a multivariate sorry uh, Gaussian distribution. And uh, actually, what happens now? We say we want to compute the posterior distribution of the of the weights given the training set. So this is a posterior distribution given the training set, and uh, Actually, in the appendix in Bishop, you have about uh, 10 pages showing that uh, you can uh, compute the posterior distribution with using uh, this formula. Uh, so it's a discussion over uh, how Gaussian distributions work in this situation. Uh, so uh, you can uh, look in Bishop why this works. So actually, after seeing endpoints in the training set, the posterior distribution of the weights right now it's uh, still a Gaussian distribution, but will have a different mean. It's MN and a different covariance matrix. Of course, the covariance matrix depends on the original covariance matrix. It also depends on the design function, like on the values of the, the basis functions and on the value of the basis functions in, in, in the training points. It also uh, uh, depends on the noise we have in the training data. Uh, and the same for the mean. The mean depends on the original mean, and we add, uh, uh, like, and, and we also add uh, something related to the actual values we have in the uh, training data. Actually, these uh, these values that we compute over here, it's a distribution. But if we would like to take only a pointwise, so this is a distribution. But if we would like to take a pointwise estimate, uh, what we take is this average. So the pointwise uh, value, it would be the average of this distribution. And this is called W map. So if you ever hear uh, uh, that you compute W map, 
it's actually the average of the posterior distribution in a Bayesian treatment of regression. And MAP means from maximum a posteriori. And actually, if you want the most probable, this is what it means, the maximum, the most probable value from this distribution is the value that you have for the average. Now, because the Gaussian distribution for the average has the highest value, and this is why it's called maximum a posteriori. So if you want to have only a pointwise estimate of this distribution, W map is that most probable uh, value. And now there are several, uh, of, uh, so this is a general treatment for Bayesian regression, but in general, we, uh, uh, we take several common priors for the weights. Like for example, here it's called, it's an uh, isotropic uh, Gaussian, like it has the same covariance in all directions and it has zero mean. So we don't have any, uh, the bias is zero if you want to, the mean is zero because we don't have any intuition of having a different value from zero without seeing any points. And we allow the weights uh, to have some uh, noise in all directions and the same noise, alpha in all directions. Uh, and uh, if we have this treatment, we're going to have these values after seeing n points, like after seeing all the points in the training set. Uh, and actually what's really interesting, if you take the log of the posterior distribution, so if we compute the log of the posterior distribution after seeing the targets, actually the logarithm of the posterior distribution will get us to this formula. Can you tell me what we have in this formula? What do we have over here in the le left term? It's a sum of square zero. So actually, if we take this common choice for the prior, uh, here in the le left term, we have the error in the data. Here in the right term, we have the error in the weights. So actually, and then we have some constant terms. So if we want to maximize this log likelihood, and these are with minus both of them, we actually the same as mi uh, minimizing the regular, regular, regularized error. So actually regularization uh, comes out of Bayesian treatment for regression on its own. And can you tell me which is the value for lambda in this case? So which is the value for lambda in this case? from this formula. Actually, in order to get the value for lambda, uh, the sum of squares is one over two, so it's not beta over two. Therefore, we need to divide by beta. So we need to multiply here by one over beta in order to have uh, the actual error in the data. And here we get alpha over beta. So actually lambda, in the simple Bayesian treatment, it's actually the ratio between the noise we allow for the weights and the noise we allow uh, for, uh, for, for the targets, yeah? Because beta is the noise in the targets. Uh, cool, and again, if you, are, if you only want to be practitioners in machine learning, so you are not interested in uh, understanding the theory, you still need to understand uh, what a linear model for regression here, because here you have, you have maximum likelihood or least squares. So maximum likelihood is the same as least squares if you go in scikit-learn. And then you have ridge regression. Yeah, you also have something related to classification. Then you have lasso. And at some point you're gonna have, uh, again, you have multitask. So several tasks we have already seen. Elastic net that we have uh, looked at. Uh, uh, and you go, you get going, and there are some, and then you have Bayesian regression. And in Bayesian regression, this is called, exactly what we have over here is called Bayesian ridge regression. You see the prior over the weight has a, uh, the mean in zero, and it's isotropic in all directions. And here the isotropy is, is actually given by uh, lambda. Uh, it, it has the same name as the regularization coefficient. So you have Bayesian ridge, and Bayesian ridge is actually Bayesian regression that we discuss right now, implemented in scikit-learn. And now let's see why Bayesian regression is nice. So first of all, Bayesian regression is nice because uh, actually this posterior distribution 
can be computed in an online fashion after each data point. So you can compute it after zero data points, then after one data point, two data points, and so on. And now uh, we're going to take a simpler example. So we have a straight line fitting uh, with linear basis function model. Uh, and uh, actually, we have several points uh, taken from a line in a two-dimensional space. Uh, and we'd like to compute which are the parameters of the line of a line. So you know a line y it's actually we have two parameters w1 x plus uh, w2 if you want or if you want a x plus b and we want to compute which are the values a and b and actually uh, these are uh, w1 and w0. And these are, this is how the prior looks like. So this is an isotropic prior. So this is the prior distribution over W. The prior distribution over W given alpha looks like this. And it's a Gaussian centered on zero, as you see, uh, with noise alpha, po uh, with noise alpha power minus, with variance alpha power minus one, minus one. Uh, and the, the, of course, you can imagine this is a heat map. So this is the most probable for value in the center, the reddest, the bluest is close to zero. So very improbable to sample from there. Uh, and here are uh, some uh, some uh, points that we sample from this space. So actually, we sample all lines uh, kind of uh, uh, with the same uh, distribution, or, or especially the ones that are here in the center. So we don't, don't know any information when we see zero data points. These lines are very different. And now what happens? We see one data point. So we are given this one data point. So after having uh, being given this uh, data point, what we can what we can compute? We can compute p of w given given this only one point, one target t1. And uh, we can compute. Of course, using Bayes theorem. So Bayes theorem means is a prior. The prior that we knew multiplied the probability of the target given the prior, which is called the likelihood. So this is the likelihood. And you see, like we have the likelihood, and we have um, now the posterior distribution. So we we multiply this prior with this likelihood, and we get this posterior distribution, which is still a Gaussian distribution. It's a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. The average is here. Now uh, the covariance matrix has shifted the axis, uh, and uh, we get to something like this. Uh, and now, when we sample lines, so when we sample uh, the lines from this space, from this Gaussian distribution, you see these lines are pretty cool from one point of view. In the vicinity of the points that we have seen, these lines have a small error. As we go farther away here, uh, the error is pretty uh, is pretty large, uh, and actually we can uh, compute which is the point that we have, uh, which is the, the lines that we want to compute. The lines that we want to compute is this one. Uh, is uh, you can see it's a, a white cross. So actually the line we want to com compute would be something like uh, W zero. W1 is dot five and W0 it's about uh, minus dot uh, 33. So it would look like 0.5x minus dot 33. And uh, we can imagine it. So if this is x equal to zero, this line that we want to compute is something like this. So uh, we have the slope dot five. If it's a slope dot five, it means uh, it will be something like this. So it's mean minus dot three. And so the correct line would be one like this. And you can see we have pretty good predictions you know, uh, somewhere here close to this point. And now we see another point. So we are given another point, another blue uh, point. Uh, and after seeing an, another point, 
And now after seeing having two points of third, this is a probability, the posterior probability of the weights given two targets, T1 and T2, the two points. And you see, this one is very good. And now uh, this posterior distribution. As we sample uh, lines from this posterior distribution, these lines kind of uh, have a small error in between. And now after seeing 20 data points, this posterior distribution is very close to the correct, uh, to the correct line uh, that we need to compute. Okay, so this is the way like Bayesian treatment works. So now in Bayesian treatment, we don't know which is a, uh, only one value for the weights. We have a distribution over the weights. We can sample from this distribution and by sampling from this distribution, we can get an infinite number of, uh, of predictor functions. If we only want the best predictor, the best predictor is W map. W map would be this one, the most red point. This is W map. The mean of the posterior W. Uh, cool. Uh, I hope this makes sense uh, and you see why like Bayesian regression is nice. But actually, this is uh, this looks more uh, at uh, W at the weight. But actually, what we really want to compute uh, in regression is a predictive distribution. So we don't want the posterior values for the weights for their own. We want the posterior values for the weights. This is a posterior uh, distribution for the weights because we can compute the predictive distribution. Predictive distribution means the probability of a new target. So this is a probability of a new target given uh, the training set, given a new point X, of course, you need a new point X, and given alpha and beta as the parameters of the model. And again, using the appendix from Bishop, uh, uh, this is called like conjugate prior. Uh, when, you, when you multiply this distribution of the target, which is a Gaussian, with each uh, conjugate prior, which is another Gaussian, the uh, posterior distribution of the weights, you'll get a, a, a new Gaussian. So this is cool. It's a new Gaussian and uh, somebody in mathematics has proven which is a value for the mean. So actually the mean is MN transpose multiplied with phi transpose, and we also uh, know which is the standard uh, deviation. The standard deviation is like this. Uh, and actually uh, here is, kind of where we stop with the Bayesian treatment, but I would like some remarks. So this is a predictive distribution, and this is, uh, this is actually the most probable value of the predictive distribution. Can you tell me what we have over here and which is the relation to maximum likelihood if you want? What does it mean NM transpose multiplied with phi of X? Which is MN? What 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 do we MN is actually what? The most likely weight is maximum a posteriori, no, for W. So it's actually uh, W map transpose multiplied with phi of x. And now you you see the resemblance. So if we use maximum likelihood, in maximum likelihood it, it would have been WML transpose multiplied with phi of x. So now the most probable prediction, because this is what it means, the average, the most pr probable prediction is W map transpose multiplied with phi of X, which kind of makes, makes sense. So instead of using, so in the formula for, for maximum likelihood, now we have W map. So it's exactly the same formula. It's it kind of like we kind of close the circle. Yeah. And again, what does it mean the square, uh, what does it mean the st standard deviation or, or the variance? Actually, the variance that we have here for the target, it's actually the noise in the data is one over the precision, one over the precision is called variance, no? Is a variance in the data, the ones that we had also in maximum likelihood, so this is the one from maximum likelihood, plus this is a variance which is related to the uncertainty of the parameters W, because you see it depends on the covariance matrix of W. And actually, it's pretty nice. What happens with a covariance matrix for W as we see more and more points? Like if you look at this, so this is a covariance matrix if you want for W, the posterior, as we see more and more points. What happens to it? Hmm? The covariance actually decreases, no? 
like the covariance is how much variance we have on these directions. Here we have a very big covariance, smaller covariance, even smaller after 20 data points. If if we have an infinite number of data points, what do you think would happen to this covariance? By using like incomplete induction. Incomplete induction, very large, smaller, even smaller after 20 points. After an infinite number of points, what do you think it will happen with the covariance? Becomes zero. It will become zero, yes. So if we will have an infinite number of points, the second term goes to zero, and the only noise is the noise that we have in the data, and uh, is the one that we cannot minimize. It's the noise in the data you have seen from, from expected noise. We can uh, expected loss. We cannot minimize this noise. Cool. And again, uh, let's look on the uh, Bayesian curve fitting for the sinusoidal function to see what happens. So we only get one point, this point. If after seeing only one point, this is a predictive distribution. Not very good, kind of bad. And uh, in pink, we have, what do we have in pink? So in red, we have the, uh, in, in red, we have TFT and W map, if you want. Or, uh, or if you want, is W map multiplied with phi of X in red. What do we have in pink? It's simple, anyone, please, in order to go forward and finish the class. In pink is plus minus one standard deviation for each point x, because you see now for each point x, the standard deviation won't be the same for each point x. The standard deviation will depend on each point x. So it's similar to, to this. If you see one point over here, the standard deviation will be smaller. So in vicinity of these points that we have seen, the standard deviation is smaller. Yeah. The same over here. We have seen a point here. The, here the Bayesian model kind of learns something. It learns to make predictions close to it. Here, when we haven't seen any point, the standard deviation is very large. Yeah. And here are samples, samples from this predictive distribution. So individual predictor functions, which are very bad, very, very bad. But in the vicinity of this point, they are pretty good, but only in the vicinity. Uh, here is after seeing two points. So after seeing two points, it's kind of, you kind of go, go in, in this vicinity, you kind of learn something again. Uh, if you take individual function, this is after four data points again, here in this vicinity, you kind of learn something, but in between you don't know anything. And this kind of makes sense because you wouldn't have anything to know for what happens in between. After 25 data points, this is a predictive distribution. Yeah, in red, the average, the most probable, the map one. Uh, and uh, it kind of makes sense. And these are like if you take uh, several samples from this predictive distribution. Uh, cool. And uh, you, well, here, here is the important observation. The level of uncertainty decreases as you have more data points observed. So where you have more data points observed, for example, let's say here, the level, uh, the variance is smaller uh, uh, from uh, values where you have uh, fewer data points observed. And actually, we're going to stop like the last part in five or 10 minutes. So you're going to talk about equivalent kernel. So we make a, a step in the direction of uh, kernel methods and SVMs. Uh, so actually, the predictive mean, uh, we can write it this way. So the predictive mean is W of X and MN or uh, W map. We said this is MN is the same as W map. Uh, so it's W map transposed multiplied with uh, the, uh, the array of the uh, uh, the array of basis functions, and actually, if you uh, go in this formula and you take M n, uh, and you take M n, uh, you, you're going to see that you can express it like this. So you can express it like this, and after expressing it like this, you can we can write it. We can write it as a linear combination of the targets. Yeah. So here it's a linear combination over, over all the n targets that we have in the training set. Uh, and this linear combination is given by something which is called equivalent or smoother, uh, equivalent kernel or smoother matrix. So this function k, it's called a kernel, equivalent kernel function. And uh, actually what we say, we say that one, 
Alternative way uh, of looking at a regression is to uh, take a linear combination of the targets. So for each new point, each new point is actually a linear combination of the targets. Uh, and it's a linear weighted combination, and it's important to understand which are the weights. The weights are given by a kernel, and actually the kernel function, this is a function, a kernel function for a polynomial kernel. Uh, it uh, actually is, it has a larger value when the value of x is equal to the value of the second parameter. Yeah. So when xj, so here when we have the same parameter, it's the largest value. This is what we mean, what we want to say. Otherwise, it's kind of a similarity function. Uh, it can be smaller than zero, so here it can go smaller than zero. So it's not uh, uh, a similarity should be always higher than zero. Uh, so it's similar to a similarity function. It's very high if the two parameters are the same, uh, and uh, as the two parameters go farther and farther away, uh, the value is close to zero, but it can also be negative. Uh, Cool. So this is called a equivalent kernel, and actually equivalent kernels looks kind of looks the same for different basis functions. So for a polynomial basis function, it looks like this. For a sigmoid basis function, it looks like this. So they kind of looks the same. Uh, and uh, this is called so it's a kernel function because we can write this function as a kernel, and we're going to see what a kernel means. A kernel actually means a dot product in, in a given space. And here we say it's actually a dot product or a covariance in the space of the features. So we, we can express it as, be, as being uh, uh, the covariance between phi of x transpose multiplied with w and w transpose multiplied with phi of x prime, the other point. Yeah. And this covariance is actually beta minus one multiplied with the kernel function. Uh, and Actually, how you should interpret this equivalent kernel? Actually, this equivalent equivalent kernel you, you you should interpret it. So, for each point, we can make a prediction based on similar points in the training set, and each of these uh, targets is taken into account uh, with a specific value. Which are the points which are taken into account with a larger weight? The ones that are closest to x. So, if a point in the target in, in the training set is close to the new point x, then the value of the kernel would be high. If a point is far away is far away from the new point x uh, x that we need to make uh, the prediction, then the value of the kernel is uh, is close to zero. Uh, so if you want, it's kind of an interpol interpolation or or an average between the value of the targets which are the most the closest to to to, to the point x for which we want to make a prediction. We, we, you can think of this uh, like a kind of k nearest neighbor, yeah. But you don't take the k nearest neighbor. You take all the uh, points, and each point will gonna have a contribution depending on how close it is or how similar the kernel uh, function is to uh, that point in the training set. So it's a k nearest neighbor uh, where you don't use like an average, and uh, you take all the points, not only uh, the best k points. Uh, cool, and like this is called an equivalent kernel because it's a kernel function. A kernel function is actually a dot product in a given space. The dot product here is given uh, in this space of features given by Psi, and we're going to talk more about this equivalent kernel and why kernels on their own are important and why like they have been uh, used a lot in uh, machine learning uh, for about 20 years or so. Uh, until deep learning uh, uh, in, two, in two weeks. And actually, there are several papers in Neo Reefs, uh, which I have seen, and some of them are becoming more and more popular, which say that uh, neural networks are very good, very good kernel approximators. So actually, what deep learning models do, they compute these kernel functions uh, um, very efficiently. Like, uh, if somebody would be able to understand which is a equivalent kernel computed by a neural model, you could compute it more efficiently because you wouldn't need to train the model. You, you would just have a mathematical function, which uh, uh, pre presumably it's simple to compute, like it wouldn't take uh, an exponential uh, time to compute. Because this is what a kernel function is like. It's a function which is easy to compute as a dot product in, a, in some space. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. 
this was the class for today. Uh, you're ha gonna have some more slides and uh, like the chapter in Bishop is longer. Uh, you This won't be part of the exam if you want to uh, understand more about model comparison and how to select the optimal number of parameters and so on. Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, look in Bishop, uh, it would be great. Otherwise, uh, uh, this is everything for today. Uh, I'm still here for questions. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, have a great evening. See you next week. Thank you very much. Well, good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye all.